So I'm uh, Hugh Porter, Vice President of College Relations. I know many of you have been with the college for about 20 years. It's such a pleasure for me to introduce Reed's new president, Audrey Bilger, to you, which I'm going to do with a series of questions and then I will get out of the way. Um, the topic will be the liberal arts. Um, there's so many things that pull us apart in the world. Hopefully at Reed, uh, the liberal arts pull us together. And as David Foster Wallace said in that nice piece that's on your tables, to which attention must be paid. I felt like he was quoting Arthur Miller there, so I like that. But um, so without further ado, good morning. Good morning, Hugh. Thank you so much. Is, is this good? Great, thank you. OK. So um, education is important to you. What drew you to that work? Well, I will say that one of the things about picking up your life after being in one location for 25 years, packing your belongings, it's almost like, for, for me, I was gathering my whole past together and you know, putting, putting it on the knapsack and carrying it along with me. So I think all the way back to when I was a kid in Oklahoma, and I was really driven by curiosity and hunger and the sense, I think if you live in the middle of the country, and I know some of you you know, have had that experience. I think at least one person from Kansas. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not in Kansas here. <laughs> um, but, um, but you, you know, you have this feeling that there are things happening all over the place, but you don't know how to find them, and you don't know where they are. And there are people who thought it had ideas, and there are all these books. And so anyway, driven by curiosity. And, you know, one of the things that I realized is that you know, even though you don't choose necessarily where you're born or your circumstances, you, you get to learn. And very early, I, I think even as an adolescent or teenager, I thought, huh, I figured it out. We're here to learn. That's what we're here to do. And so, you know, my life has really been driven by that kind of hunger for knowledge. And then in terms of coming to higher ed and making my way into a role like this, it's just a matter of different connections sort of you know, along the way lighting this path so that you know, it goes from having been a classroom teacher for you know, more than 25 years, you know, seeing students, you know, generation after generation of students come up and have that excitement and curiosity, and then recognizing that in roles like this, you can benefit a, a larger um, portion of the population on the globe even. And so to be at Reed, um, such an influential school that really stands for the values of education and, and especially this model of liberal arts education. It is truly an honor. So it sounds like you don't um, believe in this idea that uh, a liberal arts education is only for the privileged and the wealthy. No, thank you. That's a, that's a very good way of summing it up. Um, although, and it's a good lead in, into my own story, because I went to Oklahoma State, and I, I believe that you know, in, in my path in this very large um, land-grant university in Oklahoma, I also was seeking out this thing that I eventually identified as liberal arts. So I, I right away identified myself as, I'm going to be a humanities major. Again, that curiosity, I think humanities, what has been known? What has been thought? I want to get a hold of that. Um, and then I, I found that philosophy was a place where I could learn to think um, and to think critically, to think harder. And so I then went to the University of Virginia for my PhD in English. We can talk a little bit more about how I made that giant leap from philosophy to English. But, but um, when I um, took my first position after I got my PhD, it was at Oberlin College. And that's when I really saw what a residential liberal arts college was like and felt very much that this is, this is far from elitist. This is the kind of education that even if we're in a small setting with a relatively few number of people um, can have a big impact. And so that also got me interested in thinking about access to be sure that you know, even within these small communities that we're getting students from many, many different backgrounds. So did this education feel useful or exciting, both? Both, yes, is the answer to that. And in fact, yes, and. I've, I've been thinking a lot about that and. So uh, useful and exciting. So the useful and exciting, and thank you for saying exciting, Hugh, because something that 
I have been thinking a lot about as I've come to read is the idea of well, what does it mean to be academically rigorous? You know, and we, we talk about this a lot at Reed. Um, I was at the science poster event um, week before last, and um, I thought I'd stay for oh, you know, like half an hour, see, see what was going on. Um, ended up being there for almost two hours because poster after poster presented by students in you know, individually or in pairs, they conveyed this excitement and they were very good about talking about their work. But not only that, but it was clear that there was this passion. And so I, I thought, okay, yes, there, there's rigor. The, these students are doing careful um, research and um, they're able to articulate it skillfully. And you know, that would be nothing if it weren't for this heart of passion. And so I thought rigor is nothing without joy. And that's something that the Reed students, and you, you know that I can see some nods, um, you understand that from your own experience. So yes, um, for me, um, personally, of course, it's been, you know, the thing about, about a liberal arts education, so coming from philosophy and the humanities and, and, you know, having explored quite a bit in my own life, what I think is it gives you resources to always be sort of looking to see, well, what's, what, am, I, am I good here? Or do I want to think of something else? Um, do I, uh, can I do more? Um, it's, it's a sort of, it prepares you for lifelong learning. And I guess there's nothing more exciting than learning something new. And I think that for, for many of us, when we start to feel downhearted, um, we might read a book, or we might go to see a film or play or a musical performance, and it changes everything. Um, that's, I think that that's what this, this model of education prepares you for is to be resilient in that way of always coming back to a position of learning and starting afresh. So this phrase that's all over the place that read life of the mind does not feel like a retreat for you then? Yeah, not at all. And uh, I, you know, the, the thing about the sort of nervousness about that phrase, life of the mind, is that if we're saying life of the mind is, is, is pulling away from society, is thinking about knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? That's a, that's a sort of modernist idea, knowledge for knowledge's sake, like art for art's sake. You know, it's in, in um, theory um, that, that purity uh, matters as you're in, in the middle of trying to figure things out and sort things out. If you stay there, though, I, I do think that that can, that can become a kind of problematic isolation Something I felt throughout my career um, is that, that the, this idea of the ivory tower is really problematic. I mean, for one thing, this is a workplace. It's beautiful, by the way, isn't it, this, in this particular workplace? But it's a workplace. It's a workplace for our staff, for our faculty, for our students. It's not like life is some real life. The real world is happening outside. This is the real world, too, and, and so I, as we think about breaking down those ideas about academic isolation, then I believe that we're really preparing our students and also preparing the college to engage outward and also to benefit from the, the input that we can get from the community around us, from the world around us. And so that's, that's really important that we're always thinking through that. Um, I mean, I regret that the life of the mind as a phrase uh, may have um, may mean only to some people that, that isolation because the pleasure of exploration, the pleasure of thinking, that place that you go when you're um, creative or when you're writing, when you're in the moment, or when you're figuring out a complex problem, that's very powerful. And again, if it, if it stays there, it can be problematic because of the isolation, but it doesn't have to stay there. It can go outward and connect. So I have a number of uh, more questions, but um, at the end of this, we're going to turn the tables um, on you. Um, and there are three questions. I think they're on your tables. Um, and I'll just read them out, and you can be pondering them as we talk. Um, what educational experience have been, been important in your life and why? What are the particular skills and aptitudes that you believe Reed is teaching? And tell me something you'd like to see enhanced at Reed. So we'll be turning those questions back to you in a, in a little bit here. So four questions. Did I miss one? I think someone, I think anyway. someone accidentally put the Austin question. Oh, okay. There we go. 
Um, so second question for Audrey. Um, so what about these things brought you to read and have we lived up to your expectations? Read is special among liberal arts colleges. <laughs> Let me just start there. Um, as somebody who was down, down the road a ways, um, still on the, on the West Coast, but in the Claremonts for 25 years, you know, Reed was known to me um, as one of our liberal arts college sisters on, on this side of the country. What's Reed, what Reed is known for nationally and even internationally is the, the high caliber of education that we provide. And you know, as I began to consider Reed as my next home, I ran into lots of people who had ideas about Reed. And you probably get these on the road too, right? So you know, sort of one of the things that people would say is, so where is Reed? And I would say, oh, it's in Portland. Well, yeah, but like how far from Portland? No, no, it's in Portland. So that's kind of the first thing. And, and then there would be the, what about the drugs? And there would be, what about the, you know, sort of feisty student population? And so I'll say the, um, you know, discovering Reed in the midst of Portland has exceeded any, any thoughts that I could have about what it means to be at a liberal arts college that isn't in a remote setting. And this is, it's, you know, Reed is very nicely situated and, and Portland is a great city. And in terms of the, the drugs, I'm glad that it's not as crazy, honestly. You might regret that it's not as crazy, but I'm glad it's not as crazy as it might have once been um, because there's, you know, there are things that we need to be mindful of in terms of looking out for one another and safety. And at any rate, um, this, that's, that's, it's certainly not, um, you know, many people um, in relation to that just shake their heads and think they have these ideas and biases about Reed. And that's not really, that's not really where the campus is. And I, I think that that's a good thing. We can talk later if you, if you have issues with that. But in terms of, of Reed and you know, where the students are or where the community is in terms of protest or raising voices, I think it's good that there are raised voices. And what I know that Reed stands for is critical thinking and exploration. And my hope is always that we are able to at some point sit down and talk um, and that we uh, are able to you know, take apart some of the uh, presuppositions that we bring to the table and make sure that we really are um, in conversation. Uh, we're living in such polarized times to be at a place like Reed that is committed to inquiry um, is something that, that means a great deal to me. So then in, in kind of a more mundane way, when I thought about approaching Reed and, and what Reed would be like as a community, you know, I have the background of having been at places like Pomona, Claremont McKenna, Oberlin, um, and I can say there are very familiar elements. You know, a campus that's beautiful, um, classrooms where students are leaning forward and eager, and there are there are unique features to read. Um, walking across campus yesterday, I I was sort of was behind a couple of students who had come from a science class, and they were still talking in this way that was you know, very, very engaged and asking each other's qu other questions. Well, what did you get from that? And, and you know, I, I will say to you that in all my years on college campuses, I have not heard as many outside the classroom conversations about learning as I've already heard at Reed. And so I'll, I'll land there with this, which is to say that um, when I first discovered the liberal arts model with, with my um, trek to Oberlin College, I ended up taking that position, even though it was a visiting position and not a tenure track position, horrifying my, um, my graduate school advisors, um, <laughs> because, both because it was a liberal arts college, which is basically off the planet for some graduate student advisors, and, and also um, because it was not tenure track and I'd had a couple of offers that were. Um, but, but what I thought was that the quality of conversations I had in my interviews when I was on campus, with the students, walking from place to place. It's as if that conversation didn't, didn't stop. And I think that that's what our students experience. I hope that's what our community experiences. And, that, and then for you as alumni, I hope that that's something that you've taken too, that you feel like this conversation that started here 
is one that continues in various forms um, throughout your life. So um, you met Reed alumni in a big way for the first time last night, and do you, and you've had some time now with current students. Do you see common threads? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many ways to interpret that. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about your common threads in terms of do, do, you, do you look like Reed students in your demeanor and your clothing? Um, the answer is hmm, maybe a little. Um, maybe a little. The, you know, a common thread that, that I would say is that you know, you're paying attention. Even now, looking around the room, you're paying attention. You know, you may be raising an eyebrow. You may be nodding. Um, you're here. You're present. You're um, not going to just phone it in. And that means a great deal. And I think that you have that in common with, with students and the students who are currently here, that you're, you're here, um, you care. Um, this is not, I don't have to tell you, that this is not a time in which, um, this is a time in which many people think it's better to be detached a bit a little cynical even, um, diffident, ironic. And I don't think that's a Reed ethos. And I see that also in the alumni. Um, I also am grateful. Um, you all have ideas. You have ideas about the school, about the direction of the school. Um, I, um, I welcome um, hearing those. And that sense of participation is one that I think you also share with, with current Reedies. If the, one of the key models of our education is the conference, with, where people are accountable for the material and accountable to speak up, you know, I'm I'm glad that you're here and looking forward to hearing your voices more. Uh, one of your first questions in a staff meeting was you wanted to know our favorite places on campus. Mm -hmm. um, have you found a favorite place yet? That would have to be the canyon. How many people feel that way too? The canyon, yeah. Um, I was fortunate, uh, my wife Cheryl and I uh, were, were fortunate to be given a tour of the canyon um, shortly after we arrived by Zach Perry. If you know Zach, right? Zach, presiding spirit of the, the canyon revitalization. And within even just a couple of minutes of this tour, what Cheryl and I both realized is we're getting not just a tour that says, OK, here you go. We're going to come down here, and there's the fish ladder, and there's that kind of a tree or plant, which, um, of course, is a, it's a good tour. Um, it's not a bad tour. Um, what Zach was talking about was the, the history of that renovation and the thoughtfulness of everyone in planning and considering it, the number of people involved, whether it was students who were you know, painstakingly laboring over years to pull out some of the invasive plants um, or community members who had input into how best to make this a habitat for the wildlife and and the plants that that can thrive so um, the canyon and it's just so beautiful um, something that I love to do is to walk over the the blue bridge and you know sort of look one way, then look another way, um, scouting for ducks, hoping for otter and beavers, um, but, but mostly just realizing this is on our campus. This is in the middle of our campus. This is the heart of our campus. So that, that, would, be, that would be my very favorite place. And then it's kind of like a version in the student um, newspaper. There were, they, there was, there's an article about me in which I'm quoted as saying something about Jane Austen, which is the, you know when you ask what your favorite Jane Austen novel is, it's it's whatever one I'm reading right now. And I kind of think that in relation to read, it's wherever I am right now. Because again, this building is spectacular and is certainly on my list already of favorite places at read, the quality of light, the way it feels to be here, the way it feels to um, get see the students engaged here. Um, very special place. So many, many, many places are, are my favorite now. And I hope that you will share with me what some of your favorites are, particularly some of those more hidden ones that I'll have to go and look for. So uh, some people out there in the world question the value of the liberal arts. So what are your, some of your priorities for 
making sure that conversation is, and conversation is vital at Reed and beyond. Let me be clear. Um, enemies of the liberal arts, I believe, in general, either don't understand the liberal arts, and in that case, we can talk about it, or they're enemies of um, participatory democracy. <laughs> I uh, quoted in my convocation remarks a uh, uh, Brazilian um, theorist, Paulo Freire, um, who says, education is the practice of freedom. And in my view, a liberal arts education is that practice of freedom. I think that when we are asked to defend the utility of a liberal arts education, we can say there is no better education to prepare individuals for a full, rich, and meaningful life. And to be, to be clear about that, I don't know that, that you, only, you, can, you only have to attend a place like Reed to get that. You need to really be um, curious and want to engage in exploration across disciplines and asking lots of questions. So that can take place at many different kinds of institutions. So we have a very special version of this um, that we can talk about um, that, that comes from Reed. The, the idea that education is only supposed to give you one thing. It's, there's this linear, linear trajectory. That's not only not true, it's also um, it's not, it's not healthy for the world that we're living in right now where we know that our students graduating will take many different turns in terms of their career exploration. And so what a liberal arts education does is give you resources for life. One of my now jokes, and I've, I've used it a couple of times already this morning, so laugh and indulge me again, but is that, that most Reed alums that I've been meeting um, begin when I ask them about their life after Reed by saying, well, my story is not that usual, or I'm not a typical. Um, and now I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because virtually, Everyone, and maybe you are someone who you, you majored in something, you knew this early, that, that's been your dedication and passion, and, and that's great. More often, though, I hear of somebody who started here, then kind of got an idea that maybe this would be a good thing to take up, and then, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, sort of productive meandering. Um, and I do think that if, with a liberal arts education, my, my hope is that you don't despair in the midst of that meandering, that instead you're kind of always thinking, what's in my toolkit? And that's, that's something that's so special. And I do believe that it's more important now than ever for all of us to be speaking up about the value of higher education in general um, and a liberal arts education more specifically. I think those who prize ignorance are those who want to control Right, so that the, the ability to think critically, to ask questions, is, is a fundamental skill for people who want to be engaged members of society. And what could be more important? Yeah, I like that phrase in the David Foster Wallace article, um, people are prisoners who don't even know they're locked up, right? Um, um, that's the risk. Um, so, uh, one final question for Audrey, um, but uh, then we're going to come to you. And I think what I'd like to do after that is give you guys just a few minutes at your tables to talk about the questions in front of you. And then I'll just ask for hands as we go around the room. Um, the final question um, is, in fact, the one on your sheet, too, so you can think about it as well. Maybe you don't know the books as well as. Professor Bilger, but uh, what advice would Jane Austen have for a new president? <laughs> First of all, how many of you have read some Jane Austen? <laughs> Very good. If you haven't, get busy. I recommend start with, start with Pride and Prejudice. Start with Sense and Sensibility, if you prefer. Well, so, but, but if, you've, if you've read Jane Austen, and, and if you're, I won't ask for a show of hands of how many are passionate about Jane Austen, um, because it, that's a special sort of, there you go. It's a special kind of path that, that one can go down. One thing that, that you may hear from Austen's critics is oh, those are just love stories. They're just love stories. What Jane Austen would say to a new president is that love is a superpower 
that love is not something silly. Um, it's not something trivial. Um, it's very, very powerful. And, it, and that also that love is a connector and it's not something to fear. And so if I think about what I value about Jane Austen, one thing is that Jane Austen novels don't sit still. Every time I open Jane Austen, I see things I didn't see before. They're not, it's not um, flat on the page. Um, and at different stages of my life, different parts of Jane Austen, you know, kind of come into relief for me. And so I think a lot about the way that Jane Austen tells stories about individual characters, and the protagonists are women in her novels, who are forging their paths in a world that is trying to limit their agency. And that's the, the outline of that story, I think can speak to people across generations, across cultures. You know, how, do you, how do you make your way in a, a world that's telling you that you're not worthwhile or that you're not of the right social caste or that you're, um, you're not, uh, you don't have a, you don't have intelligence or, or um, even um, the ability to participate in um, the society around you because of your sex. And you know, what she says in those novels is you, you, the, these characters matter. They matter very much. And eventually, in the system that, that surrounds them, which is one in which um, people couple up in, in heterosexual marriages, um, you can find a person. And generally, at the end of Austen's novels, it's not just a person, but it's a community. And Jane Austen will make the point that sometimes it's a chosen community. You might get to say, You're, you, you come along with me for this next stage, and, and you don't. And so um, going back to the, the point about Jane Austen advising a president, um, it's, I've thought a lot about that idea of love um, since I've come to read the, the um, pins that say love read. The, I've, I've been using, as I post images of read on social media, the hashtag love read. It's not trivial. It's, it's serious. And when I say that rigor um, involves joy and passion, I think that it involves a kind of this kind of love of learning. It involves a love of the people who inspire you. And so um, I th think that Jane Austen would very much have loved Reed and would have been so glad to have wandered this, wandered this campus, to have um, gone into our library, to have meandered through the canyon. And so I, I'm, I hold on to that. And if you, um, those of you who are readers of Jane Austen, um, think that she would have additional advice for me, please channel her voice. I would be grateful for that.